typically what I say about watching the lecture is do it on an exception basis. I mean, don't go after spending, you know, a couple hours here together, go back and feel like you have to rewatch the whole lecture. Sometimes there'll be something that I talked about that you might be, huh, and you want to go back and take a look at that, then you can uh, do that at your leisure. Okay. All right, good. So I'm just going to go ahead and put us into slideshow. And uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, start talking about uh, some of the basics of governmental. And uh, we'll talk about governmental for the first three quarters of the class, really. And then um, towards the end, uh, as we head towards our final, we'll talk about not-for-profit. But in this chapter, we're going to kind of give a quick introduction to the not-for-profit industry versus the governmental industry before we then dedicate all of our attention for the balance of chapter one to governmental. Okay, so we have what? We have state and local governments, and as I've mentioned in this class, uh, we will only talk about state and local government accounting. We will not talk about accounting for the federal government. Okay, I know the federal government is a government entity. There's only one, and I doubt that you're going to be in an engagement where you're looking at federal government accounting. If I was teaching this class in, say, Washington, D.C., then I probably would focus some of our time towards governmental, uh, towards federal government accounting. So in here it's state and local. State and local means, obviously, states, the 50 states, and then what? The hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands, whatever, of what? Counties cities, townships, etc. Okay? Also, there's something called special purpose governments. Special purpose governments have a special purpose. So if we're talking about counties, we're talking about cities, they're general purpose because they do a lot of things. They provide what? Public safety. They provide culture and recreation, right? They do a lot of different things. Special purpose governments have a singular special purpose. For example, the special purpose of a school district is to do what? I believe the children are the future and all that kind of stuff, right? So that's their whole job, okay? So when you talk about a special purpose government, singular purpose, general purpose, like a school district, general purpose governments are those that have what? More than just that singular purpose like cities, counties, states are obviously what? General purpose governments, right? Okay? Okay, good. So that's what we'll focus on in this class. Now... You come over and, uh, oh, public colleges and universities, okay? Can you think of a public college university that's part of the government, huh? San Jose State, State the state universities, good, are what? Examples of what? Of public colleges, right? Community colleges. Now, when we get to the discussion where we're talking about public colleges and that, it's going to be the same thing that we learn when we learn cities, counties. They follow the same accounting as the state, cities, counties do. All of these uh, local governments, cities, counties, states, all have to follow the requirements that we're going to study in this class. Public colleges like San Jose State follow the requirements that we're going to talk about in this class. Okay. Now, we come over and we talk about not-for-profit organizations, and they are usually exempt from taxes. And I always look at this picture. I don't know if this is a, a, uh, a church or a hat that would be worn by a religious person, but it is supposed to do what? Represent religious organizations, which are not-for-profit. Not not-for-profit entities are typically what? Exempt from tax, assuming they are formed under 501C of the Internal Revenue Code. And you have different sections of 501C. By the way, we don't talk about tax in this class. This is not a tax class. Okay? When you talk about 501C, there's a 501C3 versus a 501C6, let's say. 501C6 would be a member-driven organization. If you contribute money to a member-driven organization, you can't take a tax deduction for that. 501c3, the donor can do what? Take a tax deduction for that. Okay, but these are characteristics of not-for-profit organizations like churches, that sort of thing, religious organizations. You can also have private educational entities that are considered not-for-profit. For example, 
Can you think of a private not-for-profit college? Stanford would be a private not-for-profit college. Now, look, you wouldn't know by walking around that place that they're not-for-profit because it's like a country club, okay? But they re rely on donations, right, uh, to uh, have all that from their uh, donors and whatnot. Golden Gate University, where I teach, is a what, example of a private not-for-profit college, okay? Now, we're going to see that the accounting is different when we're talking about private uh, not-for-profit entities, and we're going to get to that much later in the course, Chapter 13 and such, that we'll get into more discussion of the accounting for private not-for-profit entities. Most of our time going to be spent, what, talking about state and local government accounting, okay? Okay, good. Now, you come over, and uh, both not-for-profit and government entities then they say lack a profit motive as though there's something wrong with them. You lack a profit motive, young man. Go out there and get some profit. Well, they lack a profit motive because what? They are not there to make a profit. They are there to provide services to what? To citizens, to the beneficiaries of the not-for-profit, right? Okay. So this lack of profit motive, I don't know that I like the word lack, but this not having a profit motive, however you want to say that, um, is something that is going to distinguish this class from all the other accounting classes you've taken. Because in all the other accounting classes, not, not tax classes, but accounting classes you've taken, it's been all about, well, well, first you have revenues versus expenses if you had net income. And net income will increase the wealth of the company, will return and return earnings, and this will drive up the equity. Everything's been all about the impact that profit has on the accounting rules, right? Now we're going to turn our attention not away from the determination, not towards the determination of net income, but are we providing goods and services in an efficient, effective manner? That's why you have a separate class in governmental accounting, because it's going to change the format of the financial reports significantly from what you've been used to. Now, don't worry. We will still use debits and credits, okay? So sometimes people say, well, no more debits and credits. No, we'll have debits and credits. Being good at journal entries is going to be just as important in this class as any other accounting class. But how we array that financial information in our financial reports is going to change significantly in this class. And that's why you need a separate class. The other thing that we're going to do in this class that you don't do in other classes is talk about budgetary accounting. And you can say, wait a minute, we studied budgets. Uh, I took your class, John, and we studied in business, whatever that class was. What was it? 122A, we studied it in that, okay? Uh, so I've taken, uh, we studied budgeting. We studied budgeting in terms of how we would make different decisions, okay? What happens in not-for-profit, not, not, not for profit, but governmental, is we have formal journal entries. The journal entries are standardized that we have to make for the budget. That makes this also unique in this class. And we'll probably start to get to that. We will start to get to that in Chapter 3, 4. I've combined Chapters 3 and 4 together. So I've made Chapter 4, 4A, 4B. When we get to 4B, we'll start talking about the budgetary entries. Okay. Okay, good. Now, who sets the standards? For state and local governments, it is the GASB, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, G-A-S-B. For our not-for-profit, we turn back to the FASB. So what happens? FASB sets accounting standards for all private sector entities. For all private sector entities, we have the FASB. So that means FASB sets the accounting standards for for-profit private sector entities. And what? As you can see on the screen here, not-for-profit private sector entities, right? Okay, so we turn to the FASB to do that. Now, hey, this is new. This used to be a useless bulletin board. They put board here now. <laughs> Okay, then what? Then we have the GASB, and GASB sets the accounting standards for what? State and local governments. I don't know why I made a circle.
state and local governments. And now I know why I made a circle. And public not-for-profit entities. State and local governments and public not-for-profit entities. What is a public not-for-profit entity? Us. San Jose State is an example of a public not-for-profit entity, right? And GASB sets the accounting standards for those public sector entities. State and local governments. GASB. Now, um, let me ask you this. Where is the FASB located? How many members is there on the FASB? What does FASB stand for? Uh, federal, the, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Good. Financial Accounting Standards Board located in... Heaven, when accountants die, the FASB stands there and says, you can't come in. You've been a bad accountant. Where is the FASB? They're in, huh? Connecticut. They're located in Connecticut. Where's the GASB? They're in Connecticut. They are sister slash brother agencies, however you want to look at that. Okay, so what happens? There's a financial accounting foundation. Financial accounting foundation raises money to fund the FASB and the GASB. Okay, now, why is FASB important? Why is the accounting standard setting process important? <coughs> Who does FASB think about when they prepare financial statements? Who does FASB think about when they prepare financial statements? Huh? They think about their first love when they're setting accounting kind of statements? Huh? They think about the users of the financial statements, right? What information is going to be useful to them to make credit investment decisions, right? Okay. So who would the GASB think about? No. Government is like the preparers of the financial statements. I mean, they have to think about, look, FASB has to think about the preparers, too. FASB can't sit here and say, okay, uh, companies, go and, you know, dig to the bottom of your files and provide every piece of information to the bottom of your files because what? They have the constraint that the cost of the providing the information shouldn't outweigh the benefit, right? Okay, but at the end of the day, they got to also think about what's, what's reasonable to expect preparers to provide. So the government, state and local governments, would be what? Would be preparers of financial information. So I don't want to say no, they don't think about them because they don't require them to provide, you know, a bunch of useless information. So they think about it from that standpoint. But who's their primary concern? State and local government, uh, uh, the GASB, excuse me. Huh? People, people who live in the state. Right. They think about the citizens first. I have no idea why. I mean, what are they doing? Giving us a homework assignment now? They're giving us the citizens a homework assignment. They're just going to sit there and say, okay, citizens, you better go read this stuff because we were thinking of you when we decided how this financial report should be prepared. It doesn't make any sense to me. To me, the main users of financial reports are those entities that are going to be what? Involved in the issuance, the underwriting of state and local debt. State and local what? Bonds that get issued all the time. Those, to me, are the real users of the financial reports. But for whatever reason, they say in their requirements that they think about the citizens first. I'm like, well, the citizens don't care. Very few citizens bother to pick up a set of, let me just pick up the comprehensive annual financial report of the city of San Jose, because I want to know what's going on financially with the city. Nobody cares. Now, if you're going to buy what? Some debt from 
San Jose, from the city of San Francisco, from the state of California, you very well may be interested in their financial report, right? Okay, but they tell us that they think about the citizens first. Okay, who's FASB thinking about when they require information that's going to go into the uh, not-for-profit entities financial reports? Who's FASB thinking about when they write up the uh, accounting standards as to what's supposed to go into not-for-profit entities? They think about the, for, for private, they think about the, the organization and the cost for it. Okay, good. They think about what is the purpose of the organization, but what individuals would be interested in the purpose of the organization? Huh? Yeah, the donors, right? Hey, if I'm going to go to work all day and then turn around and say, here, here's some money, you know, uh, do something good with it, then I want to see that they are achieving their objectives, right? Are they spending my money the way I expect them to? Okay. Now, the reason I focus on these different users and who they're thinking about um, when they prepare the financial statements, by the way, before I'm before I transition to the next slide, uh, we also have the FASAB up here, which is the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board, sets the accounting standards for federal entities. The IRS, when they prepare their financial statements, they have to follow this. I was on the audit of IRS's financial statements. Yes, they get audited. My office, the GAO, looks to see that they prepare their financial statements in accordance with the FASAB standards. When the federal government consolidates its financial statements, those standards are supposed to follow the FASAB standards. Okay? That's about all I'm going to say about federal government accounting in here is that the FASAB sets the standards. Okay? Now, and by the way, they also say our primary users are the citizens, which is nonsense. Okay? But whatever. I don't know who uses the federal government standards. I know Congress doesn't look at them. So I don't know who's looking at those other than nerdy people like myself. Okay? Now, what happens? You see here. You have the FASB and the GASB. GASB is saying the citizens. FASB is saying what? Potential donors. Okay? So what happens? When we prepare our information then, we want to, a, for state and local governments, we want to show, and for not-for-profits, we want to show is money being spent for its intended purpose. Is money being spent for its intended purpose? Okay? So what happens? If I give a not-for-profit some money and I give them money to help find homes for dogs or something, then I want to see that they're using that money to do what? Find homes for dogs. So we're going to see. They're going to have to call out their programs, show how much money they spent under those programs, show how much money they raised under those different programs, right? If we're talking about the government, state and local governments, the state legislature says that we can spend a million dollars on road improvement. What do you think the financial report should show us? Whether or not they spend how much? This is the part where you chime in to prove that you're paying attention. The legislature says that we can spend a million dollars on road improvement. So we want financial reports to show us that we can spend how much? million dollars on what? Road improvement. Good. Okay. So is money being spent for its intended purpose? Okay. So we will see. The government financial reports will give us an actual versus a budget. So the budget says what? A million on road improvement? The actual might be 1.5 million on road improvement. What the hell happened? You were only supposed to spend a million on road improvement. Now, if they spend an additional amount, then presu presumably the financial reports would say, but yeah, we had an earthquake and all the roads got destroyed, so we had to spend more to uh, put them back or something, right? Okay. So that would give us a sense as to our, um, we are also going to be able to assess our financial condition. What is BS? 
balance sheet. Isn't that what a balance sheet is? You like everything you just said? Okay. Balance sheet is what? Financial condition statement, isn't it? Okay. The operating statement is what? The income statement. So we're going to see for our state and local governments, we're going to have a balance sheet. We're going to have an income statement. We're going to have a balance sheet. We're going to have an income statement. Okay. And we're going to be able to assess what? Compliance with laws, regulations, evaluating efficiency and effectiveness. So compliance with the law. The law says that we are supposed to spend a million dollars on road improvement. The financial reports will show us that we spent a million dollars on road improvement. Okay, try to stay with me, guys. I know it's difficult to stay awake at, you know, 726 at night. I know all summer you've been going to bed at 7. Okay, but try to stay awake past your bedtime. Now we're back to school. Okay. I'm 7 p.m., not 7 a.m. Okay. All right. Good. Question? Okay, good. Now, we have this concept of interperiod equity. And what this concept of interperiod equity says is that we should not spend more, we should not budget to spend more in any one period than we have revenue coming in. That's called interperiod equity, meaning we'll live within our what? Within our means year to year, won't we? Okay. Now, does the federal government practice interperiod equity? Federal government does what? Spends more money than it takes in every year, doesn't it? Every year? So when you keep doing that year after year, what eventually happens to you? You have, well, the deficit is the spending more than you bring in in any one year. In any one year. Okay, so what happens? You pass a budget to say that you're going to spend three trillion dollars, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You say you're going to spend three trillion, but your tax is only going to be two million, two billion five hundred million. So you end up with what? A 500, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 is what I'm looking for here. I think I added too many zeros. You work for the federal government long enough, you do that all the time. So what happens? You sit here and you spend what? 500 million more than you took in? That is called what? That's called a deficit. You do that year after year, and you create something called the debt. So how much is the federal debt? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> how much? Huh? Uh, I think it's somewhere up around 22 trillion now. I always guess high, guys, because I'll be right pretty soon. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twenty-two trillion dollars. They did a lot of shopping, didn't you? Didn't they? I mean, you go and you bring out your credit card, and you see that on there, you go, man, did I have a good summer? <laughs> okay. Now, what happens? I'm going to put a T next to this, not for a trillion, but for Trump. Okay. Now, when Obama got out, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I think it was maybe something like eighteen trillion. So I'll put an O there. When Bush the sun got out, 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I'll put Bush 2 on that. It was 10 trillion. When Clinton, the husband, got out, it was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. When Bush, the father, got out, it was about $5 trillion. I'll call that Bush 1. When Reagan got out, it was about $1.5 trillion. Now, if you look at every president before then, it was usually around 500 million was about the most, uh, 500 billion, excuse me, was about the most it ever got up to. And that was usually during times of war. They would go ahead and they would rack up, but then they'd pay it down when things got a little better, that sort of thing. Okay? So this thing of racking up the debt like this is a relatively new phenomenon. Now, some people believe that Reagan started this so that more and more money would be consumed paying the interest on the debt so that they could get rid of all these annoying programs that are designed to help people. Okay? But then when you got into this era in here, they started saying, well, look, we can't raise taxes because everybody wants their taxes cut, but nobody wants to give up their programs either. And we want to go, and we also want to have the ability to drop bombs in the desert whenever we want and not have to pay for it. And we want to put in what? Programs that keep the government from going under, which it almost did, make the whole economy almost collapsed. And we want to give a nice tax cut for people making, and excuse me if you're someone that's getting ready to inherit $11 million, I'm not talking bad about you, but those were the main people that benefited from the tax cut, etc. And this thing keeps going up and up and up. So, they don't practice inner period equity. Now, every now and then, you'll hear somebody say, well, we're going to pass a balanced budget amendment. We're going to amend the Constitution that will say that we must balance the budget. The revenue must equal the expenses every year. Will they ever pass a balanced budget amendment? Never. How do you pass an amendment to the Constitution? First, the Congress has to pass it. Let's say that miracle happened. Then what do you have to do? No, Supreme Court. Huh? The Senate, and the Senate passes it. Let's say the Senate and the House pass it. Then what has to happen? Then it goes to the president who, who either who signs it or just gives it. President signs it. Everything happens at the federal level. It has to happen to amend the Constitution. Then what? You have to go to two-thirds of the state and get a 50% vote of the state legislatures, right? Okay. In this class, we don't text day and night. So you go and you get to 50% of the states, uh, two-thirds of the state have to have a 50% passing the legislature, right? Okay. All right, good. Now, if the states voted for the balanced budget amendment, all the federal government would say to them at that point is, well, now we're going to cut out uh, money that we give to the states because you voted for it. You wanted us to cut it out. So why would the state sit there and what? Vote against their own interest to sit there and say balance the budget, right? So it ain't going to happen. So anyone that sits there and tells you, oh, we're going to pass a balanced budget amendment is simply trying to hypnotize you into thinking that they care about doing anything about this. Okay? Now, the other thing, the game that they like to play is they put a debt ceiling. And they'll say the debt ceiling is $25 trillion. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. They'll say that the debt ceiling is $25 trillion. We're not going to let that debt go above $25 trillion. And then they turn around and they pass a budget that will have a $4 trillion deficit. 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I don't know that they'd go four trillion. Say this number is uh, twenty-three trillion. And then they pass a budget that has a two trillion dollar deficit. So when they pass the budget, they're twenty-two trillion. Then they pass the budget that gives a true two trillion dollar deficit. Is the debt going to go over the ceiling? The debt will absolutely go over the ceiling. They will pass a law that says they have to spend $2 trillion more than they take in because that's what the law says. Here's the revenue that we can raise by the tax law. Here's the amount we're going to spend. So they will pass a law that says they have to spend more than what? The amount that will take them over the debt ceiling. Then as they get up against that debt ceiling, which they knew was going to happen because they passed a law, the Congress agreed, the president signed it, they all agreed. Is there a question? Is there a question? I was wondering what the, uh, what the, uh, if, that, if the number at the top is 23 or 25. 23. I brought it down because they usually don't have a $4 trillion deficit. Okay, I'm just making these numbers up here. But they do do what? They do pass a law that says they're going to spend more money than is necessary to take them over the debt ceiling. And then as they get close to that number, they start saying, we're not going to we're not going to raise the debt ceiling. You know, so-and-so wants to raise the debt ceiling over here because they don't believe in your future. They don't want to practice period, inner period equity. They want to lay debt on our children. Meanwhile, they already passed a law that said what? They're going to spend more than what the debt ceiling will allow. Are they playing politics with this? Yes, they are. They're playing everybody like a banjo. And they keep this game going on and on and on like this until you finally end up with what? This nonsense. Side yeah. So who actually claims the money? Like who do we owe the money to? Well, to the extent they know they owe it to people that buy treasury securities, bills, notes, and bonds. The problem is that they don't know who buys those. What happens is Bank of New York and Chase are the ones that take down practically the entire debt. They buy all of the securities and then they trade them out in secondary markets to whoever. So when the federal government redeems these and pays interest, they pay it to Chase and Bank of New York. Chase and Bank of New York then to distribute it to whoever they sold it to, but they don't know who that is. The federal government does not know who that is. So you have a very dangerous situation that what? You operate your business based on what? The selling of debt and you don't know who buys your debt. Now, all the time, what they do is they'll play the prejudice card on you. And they'll say, well, you know who's buying all this is China. You know who's buying all this, and now it's China. Before it was Japan. Japan was buying all this. Now it's China. And they come up with whoever. Meanwhile, the federal government does not know. All the federal government knows is that they sell so much to the Bank of New York, so much to China. I mean... <laughs> So it's a chase. Okay, now, now, yes, ch the Chinese government does buy some treasury securities. The Japanese government buys some treasury securities. No one knows what those amounts are. I mean, the, 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 the Federal Reserve Banks know who that is. The federal government knows who that is. Citizens don't know. They don't publish that information. It's the foreign market. I forget what they call it. And when we did the audit of the public debt, they wouldn't even show GAO that number. They showed us the total that went to all, all the central government, uh, federal uh, central governments of, of these foreign countries, but they don't tell us each country by country. So all of these different numbers you see are all very rough estimates as to who actually buys it. They know that Bank of New York and Chase buy almost all of it. Who they give it to after that, who they sell it to after that, nobody knows. For sure. Okay. Okay, so does the federal government follow the practice of interperiod equity? They do not. They spend what? More than they take in every year routinely. They pass a law to insist that they do that, right? 
and then they play all kinds of games to make you think that it's somebody else that's making them do it. Okay, okay, good. Now, not for profits, I wrote down here, how will you spend my contribution? I mean, when you look at all these different things that are listed on this slide, at the end of the day, it's asking, how will you spend my contribution? That's what we're going to see what the financial reports of not-for-profits are all about. We're not going to say a whole lot more about not-for-profits till after the second midterm. Okay. Now, anybody here ever been to Hayward? City of Hayward? What happened? Did you get lost? Did you get jumped? Hayward was hot. Hot like good, like ooh, hot. That kind of hotter temperature wise. Oh, okay. Really? San Jose is hotter than Hayward. Well, I'm of the opinion that God picked the best weather for Hayward, San Leandro, Oakland, right up in there. But then again, I'm from there, so I'm from Hayward, okay? All right, so I'm not objective in my opinion about Hayward, okay? Now, what happens? You pick up the financial reports of Hayward, and you would see this GASB reporting model. GASB requires that every state, every county, every city provides you with this basic financial reporting model. So if you pick up the financial reports of a city like, believe it or not, Hayward, you would see, and the first thing you would see is a management discussion and analysis. So the first thing you see, you see that one there? The first thing you would see is a management discussion and analysis. The second thing you would see are the financial statements. Now, when we talk about the financial statements, we call them the basic financial statements. And you see that you would have government-wide statements, you would have fund financial statements, and you would have the notes there too. Notes are always considered an integral part of any set of financial statements, right? We call that basic financial statements. Now, you look at this basic financial statement, and you can see this little arrow pointing back and forth between the government-wide and the fund financial statements. What's going on there? When you pick up the consolidated financial statements of, say, a corporation, do they say to you, well, here's company A, company B, company C that made up the consolidation? They might give you some selected segment information, but for the most part, they're showing you what? Just the entity-wide picture, right? Okay. Governments do the same thing. They show you the entity-wide picture. Unlike, however, and that's called the government-wide statements, unlike, however, you do in a corporation, they also show you the detail of funds. And we're going to learn that there are 11 different funds that governments are required to present. They take those 11 funds and they consolidate them up into the government-wide statements. The difference between what, what a corporation would do where they wouldn't show you all the detail of the individual companies that make up the consolidation and the government, they show you what? The details that make up these consolidated financial statements. So the fund financial statements really are providing you what? Additional detail. By the way, guys, my writing is almost impossible to read, so you are best off to listen to the words that I'm saying, okay, to figure out what I'm writing. Additional what? Additional details, what's in these fund statements. Now, what do you think this arrow means? The arrow means that what? We're going to have to show you the relationship between the what? The government-wide statements, which is a consolidation of the fund statements, and the fund statements. And we're going to learn in Chapter 8 what that reconciliation looks like. When you say, well, why all the way to Chapter 8? Because we have to understand what goes on at all these fund levels. So in Chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 
A will understand the detail of these funds, and then you will be in better case after Chapter 8 or in Chapter 8 to finally say, okay, how does that reconciliation work? It reconciles the fund financial statements to the government-wide statements. Okay? And then the notes there, too. That's called basic financial statements. The government-wide statements, which is like a consolidation of what? The fund statements, but the fund statements are there, aren't they? To give you additional detail, you have to be able to connect them up, and then the notes. That's all called the basic financial statements. Then you get to this bottom box, and we say required supplemental information other than the MDNA. Now, what does that tell you about the MDNA then? If this bottom box is called required supplemental information other than MDNA, what does that tell you about the MDNA? Huh? If it says required supplemental information other than the MDNA, what does that tell you about the MDNA? No, it means that it is required. This is required, and the MDNA is also required, but it's all the other required supplemental information that is not the MDNA. Required supplemental information other than the MDNA. Therefore, I wrote RSI next to the MDNA. Come on, guys, this is not hard. I wrote RSI next to MDNA because what? It is required supplemental information, but the only difference is what? We show the MDNA first, and then we show you the basic financial statements, and then we show you the required supplemental information other than the MDNA. This stuff up here is all required. You are required to provide an MDNA. You are required to provide the basic financial statements. You are required to provide supplemental information other than MDNA. All of this is required. The difference is that what? For the MDNA, we break it out first, don't we? We show you that, and then we show you what? The financial statements, and then we show you the required supplemental information other than the MDNA, because we already showed you the MDNA, didn't we? So everything on here is required? Okay. So what does the word required mean? Huh? You have to provide it. What does the word supplemental mean? It adds to something else, right? I have to drink the supplements now. It adds to something else, doesn't it? Okay. Well, if there's required supplemental information, what's the only other thing up here for them to supplement? Huh? The financial statements is the only other thing up here that can be possibly be supplementing, right? So what happens? The MDNA, the required supplemental information other than MDNA isn't saying, oh, you know, Hayward is really, really hot, especially on a Saturday night, okay? No, it's not saying that. It's saying, here's the financial picture of Hayward. Let us talk about our budget. Let us talk about why we exceeded certain amounts of the budget. Let's talk about major initiatives that are going on in the city of Hayward, et cetera. But it's all about what? Financial information, isn't it? So the MDNA is a financial document. It is supplementing what we're going to be seeing on the what? Government-wide statements and the fund statements and the notes there, too. Then we get in to a bunch of additional information, tables and tables of information that talk about here was our revenue over the last five years, here was our revenue by, I don't know, section of the city, by county, if I was a state, over the last 10 years, et cetera, right? And they start giving you additional information that's supplementing the financial report. Okay? All right. So you got to know this. We have what? We have the MDNA. MDNA does what? MDNA comes first. It's the first thing we see. It is what? Required supplemental information. It supplements the basic financial statements. You got to know that the basic financial statements are the government wide statements, the fund financial statements, and the 
notes there too, right? And then what? And then we've got the required supplement information other than mDNA. That's the third thing we see, right? Okay. You got to know this. Okay. Somebody said, well, how am I supposed to know what's more important from your slides than other things? First of all, how long have I spent on this one slide? That's usually a good indication. But I'll start putting these scary looking stars up here next to some of these things. Obviously, I want you to know this if I have a graph for it, right? A graphic for it. What's the first thing you see? MDNA. What's the second thing you see? Basic financial statements for the government wide statements, the fund financial statements, and the notes there too. What's the third thing you see? Required supplemental information other than the MDNA. Is all this required? Good. 